All right, everybody. Welcome to the program. Let's go ahead and get today's show started. Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It is good to be with you this Wednesday at noon for another edition of our program. As always, my name is Chris Smith, and I work at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I will be your host today, facilitating and conversating with all of you, our viewers, and with today's guest speaker so that we can learn something new about what's going on out there in the world of science or technology, education, mathematics, or in the case today, uh, we're going to be doing some really cool geoscience. We're going to be meeting a geologist who's doing some pretty interesting work. Of course, the month of March, although it is very nearly at its close, is Women's History Month. And so all month long here at Lunchtime Discovery, we have been celebrating and meeting interesting women who are doing some fantastic science and who are achieving awesome stuff right here in the state of North Carolina. And of course, we're going to do that again today. I want to remind everybody, though, that next month is also a special month. It's April, which means Earth Day is coming up soon, and we've got a special series all about Earth that is coming up. We'll be celebrating Earth Month every Wednesday at noon here on the series, so make sure that you're signed up for the Lunchtime Discovery Series email newsletter so that you can get the links and the information to participate every single week. Again, we're going to meet some interesting people, we're going to learn some interesting things, and I'm really looking forward to it. For today's program, I would like everybody to meet Dr. Heather Hanna. Dr. Hanna is a geologist with the North Carolina Geological Survey and has uh, carved out a pretty special interest and specialty in forensic geology uh, ge and geochemistry, which uh, I, I've seen Dr. Hanna talk about this before, but it's been a while. Uh, and so I'm really excited that we could bring this topic to the Lunchtime Dis Discovery Series today. Uh, Heather, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Uh, I understand that we're also kind of in a special time for NCGS right now. Is that right? Yeah, the North Carolina Geological Survey is celebrating our 200th anniversary this year. Uh, we are the oldest geological survey in the country. And there is a website, um, if you just Google North Carolina Geological Survey, 200th anniversary, we do have a, a website uh, kind of talking about that and talking about the activities we have planned throughout the year to celebrate. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm going to have to check that out then. <laughs> I, I wasn't aware that we had the oldest one in the country. That's pretty cool. Yep. North Carolina is always ahead of the time. <laughs> we're, we're very proud to be turning 200. Excellent stuff. Uh, well, I'll go ahead and turn the show over to you. I'm excited for your presentation. Okay. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Heather Hanna, and today I'll be talking to you about forensic geology at the North Carolina Geological Survey. But first, you may be asking, well, what is forensic geology? Well, that's a great question. Forensic geology simply applies geologic knowledge and methods to answer questions raised by the legal system. Now, there are a couple different ways that forensic geologists, or I should say forensic geoscientists, can aid law enforcement. Uh, one is the search for burials. Now, those are the geophysicists. They use ground penetrating radar to look for disturbed ground that could be burials. Um, the second is examining geologic trace evidence. And that's what we'll be talking about today. But you may be wondering, how can geology help solve homicide cases? We, we get a lot of homicide cases. Well, let's look at this map here. This is the geologic map of North Carolina. Now within those maps, you see all these different colored polygons. Now, those different colored polygons represent different packages of rock. And within those packages of rock and between those packages of rock, you have variability in both the types of minerals that are present and the chemical composition of those minerals. So that means geology can help us identify how a site is different from other potential sites. Now you may be wondering why we would need to do that. 
Well, let's say you have um, soil or geologic materials from a crime scene. Now, we want to compare that to other areas that a suspect was around the time the crime occurred. Maybe that's their, their residence. Maybe that's their place of employment. Um, well, we want to collect samples from those. And we want to see if there is something about the crime scene that makes it unique from these other, other locations. And once we figure out if that uniqueness exists, what that uniqueness is, we can see if that uniqueness is also present on, say, the suspect's shoes or the gas pedal of their car or a, a shovel, um, any, anything they, they may have been wearing or used around the time the crime occurred. Now, there are a couple different ways geology can make a site unique. One is the presence and or composition of naturally occurring minerals at the site. So in this photo here on the left, uh, that's at Falls Lake. Um, and this beach is neat. It's, it's weathering this the schist and you have garnet, which is this red mineral here. Uh, you have garnet present in the, the beach sand there. Now, if you go to other beaches on Falls Lake, the geology uh, tends to be different. And so that garnet won't be present. The other way is uh, that geology can make a site unique is through the presence and or composition of materials brought into a site. Uh, so geologic materials are commonly used for landscaping and um, construction, that sort of thing. And for example, this is the driveway outside the North Carolina Geological Survey's Coastal Plain Office. And you'll see that's gravel. Now that gravel was brought in from a quarry. Most of the other driveways in the area are paved. Um, I know one other gravel driveway in the area, although actually I think that's paved now, but it was actually a different type of gravel. So the presence of the gravel at the site can make this site unique from other locations. And that gravel can get tracked into cars and, and on the floor mats and stuff and in shoes, as you can, can see here. Now, all that is based on low cards exchange principle. Now, as a geologist, I like to call this the plate tectonics of forensic science. Um, it really is that important. Now, low card simply states, whenever two objects come into contact, there is always a transfer of material. And this forms the basis for the collection and examination of all trace evidence, and it provides the possibility of associating people, objects, and locations involved in a crime with each other. Now, let's move on to, now that you have a, a background in forensic geology, let's move on to forensic geology at the North Carolina Geological Survey. The NCGS has helped law enforcement investigate multiple murder cases, and we'll be touching on a few of those during this talk. Now, the sorts of things we may be asked to do, um, determining if a suspect could have been at a crime scene, um, cases where a body may have been moved, and even helping narrow the search for a missing person. Now, this isn't a common service for surveys to be able to provide, but it's very useful to law enforcement. And it's great for the survey too. Um, it, it brings a lot of, of positive attention to a, a small uh, state agency. Um, now, we had this program going for many years at the North Carolina Survey. Um, and uh, unfortunately, now we're not able to offer it at the moment. We need to get a key staffing position filled, um, but we're hoping that um, if we, well, we need to have a key staffing position created, but we're hoping if we can uh, get that key staffing position that we will be able to start offering this service again. So the first case I want to cover um, is a missing person case that ended up unfortunately being a homicide. So Cynthia Moreland was kidnapped from the parking garage in Raleigh on August 22nd, 2006 and Devin Chance was arrested the next day after using Moreland's debit card. Now, when the North Carolina Geological Survey uh, was first brought in this case, it was thought to be a missing person case. Um, and they were being asked to help narrow the search for the body. So this case work was done by my colleagues, Bill Bradley and Jeff Reed, and I believe this was actually the first case the North Carolina Survey worked. And they looked at the victim's car, which um, the victim had been abducted in, and they found in the wheel well on the passenger side and the uh, tailpipe that there was this uh, material that was rich in white mica. 
And they also found on the suspect's shoes that there was white mica. And that's what white mica looked like. So they suggested searching in an area that um, you would expect to see white mica, such as on a granite like this. Um, however, the body was found a couple weeks later down here in Coates. Now, Coates is on um, the coastal plain, which the coastal plain is a bunch of uh, sediments that have been deposited that were eroded off um, other parts of the state, like the Piedmont. And um, that mica ended up being a bit of a red herring for finding the body, but once the body was found, it was useful. You see the site on uh, the coastal plain you don't tend to have a lot of mica on the coastal plain mica doesn't su doesn't uh, survive survive that transportation and deposition very easily uh, but when we look at the site here this is a, a google image of the site you see this gravel driveway here and this is where a witness reported that the victim's car had been pulled in uh, front first here and this gravel driveway contained abundant white mica something, like I said, you, you don't normally see on the coastal plains. So this driveway made this site unique from other locations. Now, let's zoom in closer and look at some of the samples. They looked at a sample here from the, uh, the driveway and they noted that there was white mica, mica both in the southernmost impression, tire impression, and also in the gravel from the driveway area. So the white mica present on the victim's car and the suspect's shoes was consistent with white mica in the driveway material. Um, and that driveway material helped make that site unique from other locations on the coastal plain. So that information is useful uh, in discussing plea deals. And in this case, the suspect fled out. So the next case we're going to move on to was uh, one of our more high profile cases. And this was North Carolina v. Mario McNeil, also known as the Shania Davis case. So on November 10th, 2009, uh, five-year-old Shania Davis was reported missing from her home in Fayetteville. Now, um, Fayetteville police who were investigating the case uh, obtained surveillance video from a hotel in Sanford, North Carolina, we showed McNeil carrying Davis through the lobby of the hotel. She was wrapped up and not moving at the time. So on November 13th, McNeil is charged with kidnapping and he turns himself into police. Now, at this point, soil samples are collected from McNeil's car. And I want to say that McNeil's car was actually um, new to him at the time. Um, he hadn't had it very long and it had been detailed before he purchased it. So we were working with a pretty clean slate. Um, the next day, Shania's mother is arrested and charged with murder related to her disappearance. Um, now, during this time, they're looking for Shania. They're, they're looking for her body. Uh, the uh, local citizens are out helping do grid searches. Um, and they were having a lot of difficulty finding her. Um, now, I was told that the um, McNeil's then attorney, this was not the attorney he ended up going to trial with, um, apparently he told the attorney where the body was and the attorney told the police. But remember, this would not be uh, something the jury was allowed to, to know because it goes to attorney-client privilege. Um, but that's why they were able to find her body. It was really well hidden in this drainage that uh, was largely covered with kudzu. Um, so her body was found on November 16th, and three days later, McNeil was um, charged with crimes, including Shania's murder. So let's look at the evidence we're working with in this case. We had um, soil removed from the gas pedal of the suspect's car. We also had two soil samples collected from the body recovery site around along Walker Road, which is kind of is midway between um, Fayetteville and Sanford, uh, a little actually significantly closer to Sa the Sanford side. Um, we had a sample that was collected near the side of the road where the suspect's vehicle was believed to have been parked. And we had a second sample that was collected from back near where the body was actually recovered from in the drainage, where someone would have had to have stood to have pushed the body into the drainage. We also had um, three index or alibi locations that um, we uh, 
collected samples from, which were locations where uh, interviews with McNeil uh, determined he had been around the time the crime occurred. So one of these was the residence McNeil was staying at in Fayetteville. Another one was this apartment complex, which is a couple of blocks away from the residence. He parked his car right here that night um, and then walked to the sidewalk and down to the residence. So we collected soil from there. And finally, from the Davis residence where McNeil reportedly picked her up that night. So here's a geologic map. And we have Sanford up here and we have Fayetteville down here. Now, the crime scene or the body location was here on the edge of this metamorphic unit. And we have this granitic unit here that has garnet. So this is a, a granite with garnet. Say that five times fast. Um, and that will become important later. Now we had all the uh, index samples or these alibi samples from the residence, the place where we parked in the Davis residence down here. And um, first thing I do when I have these samples is I do a visual analysis. Um, a picture is worth a thousand words, especially when you're explaining something to a jury. So I take the samples and I sieve them to remove the really fine material, your, your clay and your silt, because that material is very highly variable. And so you need a lot of it to do a reliable analysis. So right now it's not really a material that we, we tend to use for our analyses, but the, the sand size, the, the larger fraction is really useful. So I take the sand size fraction and I, I examine it, I see what minerals are there and I take pictures of it under the microscope and in this case, all of the um, samples, both from the gas pedal, the body recovery site, and the um, index sample locations, they all had these uh, iron titanium oxides. So I ended up doing a chemical analysis on those, which I'll get to in a minute. Additionally, the gas pedal and the two samples from the body recovery site had garnet, that's this red mineral here. Now, we didn't find garnet in any of the Fayetteville samples, and we understand geologically why that probably is. Um, but note, remember I noted that the uh, granite with garnet uh, was located kind of near the body recovery site, and we think that was the ultimate source of these garnets. Now, while I was doing the visual analysis, I uh, stumbled on these metallic fibers. Now, these were only present in the gas pedal, and the sample from the body recovery site closest to the road. Now, metallic fibers are out of my area of expertise. So I took these to NC State. Um, one great thing about forensic science is it's very collaborative. So I took these to NC State um, to Roberto Garcia, who is a metals expert. And he examined these using a scanning electron microscope. And he was able to determine that they were the same type of metal or the same type of, of steel. Now, what he ended up concluding these fibers were was uh, this is an area where people dress deer. And so uh, they apparently throw a winch cable over the limb of the tree and they wrap it around the deer's ankle and they hoist the deer up. And he thinks these are the frayed cable, um, frayed pieces of a winch cable. So let's take a look at uh, what we have so far from our visual analysis. You can ignore this brake pedal. There wasn't any soil on it. But uh, all the samples have these iron titanium oxides. Garnet was only in the samples from the gas pedal and the body recovery site. And only the gas pedal and the body recovery site sample closest to the road contain the metallic fibers. So you see the visual analysis is already suggesting this um, similarity or, or this consistency between the gas pedal and the body recovery site. So we wanted to take this a step further. So um, I analyzed, um, and my collaborator on this case was uh, Phil Bradley at the North Carolina Survey, um, as well as um, some folks at uh, NC State, or not NC State, sorry, some folks at um, Fayetteville State that ran the hyperprobe. And then of course I mentioned Roberto at NC State. So, um, I use this hyperprobe at Fayetteville State. Um, it is, uh, you can analyze an area 30 atoms wide, um, magnify it for 300,000 times. 
So what that enabled me to do is to take this, um, these samples and pick out these grains that I wanted to analyze, pick a bunch of grains, mount them and zap them individually. Then I could uh, take an average of those um, compositions and, and get an average composition for the grain. Now, a lot of analysis in the geoscience, a lot of the instrumentation is set up for what we call bulk analysis, where you take a, a chunk of soil or other geologic material and you dissolve it um, as a bulk sample. Now, this is a problem for forensics uh, for two reasons. One, the um, it's called trace evidence for a reason. Uh, when you have soil on, on shoes or sweatpants or a gas pedal, you tend not to have enough to do the bulk analysis. Um, and also on something like footwear or a gas pedal, you could have a mixed source. And you'll see that in a, a later case, um, an example of footwear that has soil from more than one source on it. And so by in, analyzing these individual mineral grains, we're not ending up with something homogenized that we can't really use. So we were really lucky to be able to use this um, hyperprobe at Fayetteville State to, to do that analysis. So each one of these mineral grains represents, or each one of these dots represents a mineral grain and its average composition. Um, so this plot, I actually did a bunch of plots related to this, but I'm only going to show you one um, just to, to keep your interest. Um, and this is aluminum versus manganese. And there's a reason I didn't adjust the scale on this, you'll see in a minute. But the blue are samples from the gas pedal and the, uh, or the, the mineral grains from the gas pedal. And the pink and the green are the mineral grains from the body recovery site. And you can see they all fall around or, or below the detection limit for manganese on the instrument. But when we add in the samples from Fayetteville, which are in these yellow, green, and, and purple, you'll see they fall above the detection limit of the machine. And so that's a significant difference. So our conclusions in this case, um, the forensic geology analysis uh, showed that we had both in terms of visual analysis and the um, chemical analysis that the crime scene was different from the samples collected from Fayetteville and that the material in the gas pedal was consistent with the crime scene. So I testified on mineral grain analysis and Roberto testified on the metallic fibers analysis and both were important in demonstrating a physical link between the suspect and the body recovery site. Now, these were also taken in conjunction with some cell phone data. Um, when McNeil left, uh, when McNeil placed a call before leaving Sanford and his cell phone pinged a tower. And um, so they, they had the time when he was leaving Sanford. And then um, they uh, he called again before he reached Fayetteville and it pinged the tower again. And it's not that far of a drive. And at that point, he, he should have been back in Fayetteville. And he said he drove straight back to Fayetteville and dropped Shania off at her house. Um, her family says she did not. He did not. But um, uh, what we got from the cell phone data was that he wasn't back in Fayetteville when he said he was and when he should have been. Um, so the defendant was found guilty on six counts, including murder. Now, next we have an attempted murder. Um, a man with a history of domestic violence was suspected of standing in his ex's flower bed and throwing Molotov cocktails through her window. The police searched the suspect's residence um, and they found the ingredients for Molotov cocktails, but there was concern that that would be ruled circumstantial. And so uh, they asked us, the um, DA's office, or sorry, the Winston-Salem Police Department asked us to examine a pair of running shoes that belonged to the suspect that had soil adhered to the sole and a dental stone cast with soil and quarry gravel um, that was collected from the crime scene, um, the soil right outside the window. Uh, there are also scaled photographs of footprints in that soil that a collaborator looked at, and I will discuss that in a minute. So this is the geologic map where the crime scene is. It's in a, a biotite gneiss and schist, uh, which means lots of mica. Um, and here is the dental stone cast. Now, if you're unfamiliar with dental stone casts, um, these are, if you've ever been to the dentist and they've taken an impression of your teeth, like if you got braces, that's a dental stone cast. This is just 
a slightly different use for the same material. Um, so these are spread on footprints, tire tracks, that sort of thing, when they want to preserve an impression. And the great thing for me as a geologist is these lift the top inch or so of soil where someone, possibly the suspect, put their foot. And so there's great material for me to analyze. So I took the soil off the dental stone cast and I used a Munsell soil color chart to determine the color. Now, Munsell charts are great because they standardize how we see color. You see, perception of color varies from person to person. Uh, so a color I see as purple, somebody else might see as blue. Um, additionally, your perception of color changes with uh, lighting. So David Hinks at NC State, um, he's in the College of uh, Material Science. He does a great, or College of Textiles, sorry. He does a great uh, demonstration where he takes a dress that belonged to his daughter when she was a child, and he puts it in this light box. Then there are three different types of light. And in one part of the light box, the dress looks purple. In another, it looks blue. And in the third, it looks red. So lighting and just kind of your personal perception determine how you see color. And when we compare the soil to these color chips in the Munsell book, this is kind of like a, a book with a, a bunch of um, kind of pricey color chips, like what you'd find at, at Home Depot almost. Uh, you compare it to the color chips and it enables us to standardize how we, we see color. So the next piece of evidence are these shoes. Now you can see there's actually color from more, or there's soil from more than one source, source on these shoes. Um, now the soil from the crime scene with the Munsell color chart, it came back this yellowish red, 5YR5 over 6. Now the shoes, they have a yellowish brown soil and yellowish red, 5YR5 over 6. Um, so I removed the soil into three piles, one with the yellowish brown, one with the yellowish red, and one where they were mixed. And I did the visual analysis on the yellowish red soil. The, the yellowish brown soil could have been from anywhere. Um, it wasn't relevant to the case. So let's take a look at the minerals that we found. And this is the dental stone cast, which is the crime scene. And this is the material from the shoes. Now we found the same suite of minerals in both this dark mica, this white mica, and this, these um, basically iron oxide minerals. So um, this is the sort of material we would expect to occur naturally at the site, given the geologic unit it's located in. But we had something additional in both the shoes and in the crime scene. Uh, we had the, this quarry gravel that made the site unique from other sites. And uh, we know it's quarry gravel because it's fresh. It's not really weathered. Now, not only did we have this kind of light colored quarry gravel, but we had this darker quarry gravel too in the shoes in the crime scene. So um, we use the soil color, the mineral assemblages, and the presence of quarry gravel um, in both samples. And that um, indicated that the soil on the shoes was consistent with soil from the crime scene. Now, the other component to this was the footwear analysis. And that was done by Gary Knight, who's an expert on forensic footwear. and um, when I finished removing the soil from the shoes, Gary came over and he did a print of the, the sole of the shoe and he compared that to the scaled footprint at the crime scene. And he was able to show that the shoe matched the footprints down to the wear and tear on the tread. So these are both forensic sciences about putting together pieces of puzzle. Um, these were both pieces of the puzzle. Um, the suspect was arrested and the case pled out. And finally, this is the last case we're going to talk about today, and then we'll take some questions. Um, this is North Carolina v. Jordan Peterson, and this was actually my first forensic case. Um, uh, my collaborators on this include Phil Bradley and Kim Hutchison, who was in the soil science program at NC State, the soil science department at NC State. Um, so on December 11th, 2008, Anthony Bowling was shot to death on a soil path off Capitol Boulevard in Raleigh. Uh, Jordan Peterson was quickly arrested by the Raleigh PD who seized um, a pair of pants and shoes that a witness said Peterson was wearing when the witness said he committed the crime. Now that witness was his on and off again 
at that moment off again, girlfriend. Um, what was happening here was uh, Jordan Peterson and the off again girlfriend were doing what's called flipping sets. And that's when they shift from one gang to another gang. And the off again girlfriend um, said that she drove Jordan Peterson to the site. He got out of the car. He ran up that um, dirt path and he came back and he called the leader of the new gang and said, it's done. But the thing about this uh, case is that Anthony Bowling was shot in the evening and the body was out all night and it rained. And that rain means that some of the forensics they would have of normally consulted weren't usable. And so the White County District Attorney's Office requested that um, we examine uh, soil from the shoes and um, sweatpants and the crime scene. So let's take a look at that, that evidence. Um, as I mentioned, we have a pair of shoes. These were black Nike shoes. We have one pair of men's dark colored sweatpants. We have two of those dental stone casts um, collected from the crime scene and um, the suspect wasn't forthcoming about his location around the time the crime occurred so we weren't really able to, to sample places that um, uh, that he directed us to um, so we collected uh, mica from geologically representative locations uh, around the triangle so here are the shoes and you can see there's not much soil on these shoes, not enough for uh, a bulk analysis. But we were very fortunate that the hyperprobe was actually being constructed during this. So this was the first case we used the hyperprobe for as well. And here's the sweatpants. Again, we have a little bit of soil, but not much. Now, here's a Google image of the crime scene. So the crime scene here, you can see it, it's really light colored there. And here in the, uh, the close-up, here that, that was actually my soil science collaborator from Hutchison. You can see this is really light-colored soil. This is not what you expect to see or want to see if you're digging in your garden, for instance. That looks more like this. Now, this was our background control sample. It was collected from over here. And um, our soil scientist concluded that, um, so as you probably know, as you go deeper, soil changes character. You go through these different horizons. And our soil scientists concluded that the, the top few horizons had been removed um, and potentially sold as topsoil, carted off to somewhere else. Uh, we don't know what happened to them, but we do know that they were, they were removed. They're not there. And so that exposed this lower um, soil horizon, which made the site unique from other locations. So I did the visual analysis um, and this is sample from the shoes and we had mica in the sample from the shoes. Uh, these are the sweatpants. You can see the fiber right there. Um, we have mica in that as well. Dental stone cast, lots of, from the crime scene, lots of mica and abundant mica. This is our other crime scene sample, very abundant mica in that. Now, I love using mica for cases like this. I've used mica for a couple of cases. And that's because mica is, you could kind of call it a trash can mineral. There are a lot of um, elements that can go into mica. And what goes into mica uh, depends on kind of the, the local variability, the pressure, the temperature, the, the elements that are, are available. And uh, so you can get a lot of variability in mica. In fact, um, we even had one case that we won't be talking about today, where when I plotted up the samples from the crime scene, I saw the mica pulling into separate um, fields. So we even have variability on the scale of a crime scene. So let's take a look at the geologic map. The crime scene is here in the granite. And down here, we have the Nightdale Quarry, which is in the same unit as the crime scene. We have material from Falls Lake, and we also have a sample from Triangle Quarry. Now, let's take a look at the geochemical data. So this plot is aluminum versus potassium, and the crime scene samples are in the green and orange, and the sweatpants and the Nike shoes 
are in the blue and pink respectively. Now, one thing I want to say going into this is we're not going to have matches. Uh, the variability that enables us to use the, the chemistry of these um, mineral grains um, is the same variability that means things aren't going to be exact. And so in this case, we're looking at it with the geochemist size. So we're looking for similarity in trends in the data. We're looking for some overlap, but it doesn't have to be, you know, perfect overlap. And we're looking for things like multiple groupings. For instance, we see nice overlap in the trends between the shoes, the sweatpants, and the crime scene here. And we see some overlap in the, the kind of where they are in the potassium aluminum space on the diagram. We also see there's a second field over here for both the crime scene and the Nike pants. So with respect to these elements, we have two fields of data. We have kind of two populations of mica. Now, with these other samples, the, the nitro quarry, the triangle quarry, and false lake, we want to see if the composition um, of the mica can can help show us that the crime scene is unique from these locations or, or determine if the crime scene is unique from these locations. So the night jail quarry you see is overlapping some with um, one of the crime scene samples. The triangle quarry has two groups. One is definitely not consistent with the crime scene or the, the samples from the, the shoes and sweatpants. The other one is close enough we can't rule it out yet. And we have Falls Lake up here, which is um, off by itself. Now, when we look at these, we look at multiple diagrams. And it needs to be consistent in all of them to be considered consistent. So here we have potassium versus sodium. Um, if you zoom in on this area, you do see nice overlap and consistency and trends between the crime scene, the shoes, and the sweatpants. Uh, triangle quarry is down here. It's close enough. We can't necessarily rule it out yet. Um, the Nightdale quarry is over here in the corner. And so that one, we can, um, we can rule that one out. And the Falls Lake is up here. And finally, we have beautiful overlap between the crime scene and the shoes and the sweatpants. Falls Lake, we've already ruled that out. And you'll notice the triangle quarry and the night drill quarry samples both fall below the detection limit for magnesium. This is magnesium versus iron. And so we can roll them out. So what we have shown with this is that the um, mica collected from the shoes and the sweatpants are consistent with the mica from the crime scene because they have that notable overlap. They have the same trends. And with respect to some elements, they have these two compositionally different groups. But also that mica collected from crime, the crime scene is compositionally different than uh, mica collected from um, other locations in the greater triangle area. Uh, so I testified in that case, and that testimony actually set a precedent um, for, at least for Wake County, as the first time this type of analysis had been used in trial. Um, a collaborator did some research and actually couldn't find um, evidence of this method being used um, anywhere previously. So this is at the very least set a precedent in Wake County. Now, I should say this method um, was actually not new. The, the instrument was new. This was actually the first case, um, the, the first kind of anything done on that instrument. It was brand new at the time. Um, but the uh, the method using microprobe is is actually as old or older than, than I am. Um, so the method has been around for a long time and is well established. It just hadn't been applied to forensics uh, before that we know of. Now, the trial resulted in a verdict um, guilty of first degree murder with the mineral grain analysis playing an important role. And I've been told that the suspect has since confessed in prison. So, and with that, I can take any questions. Heather, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great to have you back. And these cases are fascinating. Thank you. I mean, the like the level of detail that you can investigate uh, a mineral grain and then connect it back to like such small geographic locations. I mean, that's really impressive. Thank like you. methodology and insight. Um, viewers, let me remind you real quick. Uh, drop your questions, thoughts, insights as well into the chat right there on the YouTube channel so that uh, we can take your questions we're going to do that in just a moment. 
But Heather, uh, I'm kind of curious what you think about uh, the limitations of forensic geology. Like, for example, you were showing us lots of geologic maps, and I'm thinking uh, an analysis like what you're doing is going to or might rely on really detailed maps, depending on the scope of a crime scene. So what do you feel like, uh, what are you up against when you're performing these kind of analyses? So that's a that's a, a, a good example with those maps. Um, these mm. maps, I do rely on them. They, they help me interpret the data. They, um, they're, they're very important to the investigation, but um, not all of the state and certainly not all of the country um, has been mapped at, uh, at the, the scale at, at which I use. And so uh, geologic mapping and, and the continued um, geologic mapping is, is very important for, for this. And if I, I hit an area where we don't have the scale of geologic mapping, it, it makes my job a lot harder. Um, another challenge I face, especially working on the coastal plain, is that not all um, minerals are suitable for analysis. Um, quartz being the main culprit, the main issue, Quartz is everywhere, and it's the bane of my existence. Um, I, I would love to be able to to do some some work, get a grant to, or something to look at uh, laser ablation ICPMS to see if um, there's been some work that uh, looking at um, the chemistry of, of quartz. Quartz is like 99 point something percent, 99.6, 99.8 maybe, um, almost, almost entirely silica. And you do have some elements that are an inclusion, some elements that can go into to quartz um, that they have seen some promising research that those vary on the scale of like a drainage basin. But um, at this point, we can't really use that for, for the type of analysis I do. And I don't know if we'll ever be able to use it. So so I need um, minerals at the crime scene that are, are suitable for analysis. Um, not, there was not all quartz. And um, uh, sedimentary environments, like, like I mentioned, the coastal plain, um, because you're, you're taking um, uh, material from a large area and you're kind of depositing it in this other area, um, I'm, I'm still kind of discerning um, with, with sedimentary environments. It kind of varies from, from environment to environment and location to location. Um, but those can be a little little more difficult to um, to decipher um, as well. But we've uh, we're we're able to um, to find cases like with uh, with the Shania Davis case uh, where we were we were really able to see some real geologic differences uh, between the crime scene and and um, the coastal plain. But if I if I go to other states where you just have massive 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 areas that are, are just all sedimentary and don't have the geologic variability of North Carolina, it, it could be more tricky. There's, there's more work to be done in that area, that's for sure. Have you had to turn down any casework? Because uh, you look at a map and you go, uh, the whole thing is sand, can't help you. Well, what I, what I do is I, um, I, I will look at, at the samples just to see if there's anything surprising in the samples, because you you know you like with those metallic fibers. Um, if if I hadn't been able to tell anything from the geology, I still could have referred them to uh, metals experts to look at that. So I, I will take a look at the I'll take a look at the geology, um, the geologic maps. That'll kind of help set expectations going in, and I'll take a look at the material and and I'll I'll see if I can can help them. But you know there are circumstances where you know where there's just not not the variability where you you don't necessarily have um, can't necessarily say okay this crime scene is unique from these areas but fortunately those are few and far between at least from my experience so for the most part you know we're we're able to actually examine the evidence and and determine how the crime scene is unique. Excellent, excellent. All right, let me grab some questions from the chat here. Uh, looks like the first one that i've got is going to come from kayla how do you explain this information to juries without losing them seems very complex that is a that's an excellent question um that's something i practice a lot uh we analogies are great when i talk about rocks and minerals i talk about like 
granola bars for rocks and chocolate chips and raisins and stuff like that, making up the minerals. Um, I love my food analogies. I do a lot with food analogies because everybody can relate to a food analogy. Um, a lot of it is breaking the charts down and going through them like really step by step um, and and just trying to explain things in a, in a way that, that is approachable. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, I started as a teenage volunteer at um, Ohio Center of Science and Industry, COSI, in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And so they got me started young explaining science to the public. And that was probably one of the, the most valuable things I could have done for a career in forensics because, um, you know, I, I really learned early on how to to break this stuff down. So so that was very fortunate. But yeah, it's a lot of, of thinking, how can I explain this? A lot of, of kind of looking for analogies that'll be useful and a lot of photographs, a lot of, lot of using images to help tell the story. Okay, good question. Um, have you ever helped with any trials where you showed or proved that someone was innocent? That's actually a great question. Now, this method, um, it isn't great for determining innocence, like um, you know DNA or something. Now, mm. I did have a case I didn't present today, um, but it was, um, so in this case, I analyzed a pair of shoes. Uh, so this was a, an individual who was accused of murdering his wife. And I analyzed a pair of shoes. And um, I compared the soil in the shoes to um, an area. He So when they they served him with the search warrant and seized the shoes, he was coming out of, of wood. So I collected samples from the traverse he'd taken through the woods in this kind of park area. Um, I collected... Uh, there weren't wasn't any mica in, in the residence. I collected um, samples from the crime scene, and the um, the soil on the shoes matched the soil where he was coming out of the, the the wood. Now there are any number of reasons for that, and I did testify in that trial, but the results were neither here nor there because um, the the individual could genuinely be innocent and was never at the crime scene. The individual could have changed their shoes. The individual could have washed their shoes possible they just didn't get enough soil and it was flooded by this other signal now in this case um there were uh the suspect was seen on video um at a supermarket wearing a different pair of shoes and he was unable to produce that pair of shoes for analysis um so it's it's possible we were analyzing the wrong pair of shoes and some of you if you follow the case closely may recognize that i'm talking about the bradley cooper case and he has since pled guilty. So we, we went through the trial, he got a new trial, and then he ended up pleading guilty before the second trial could take place. So that's an example of, of how, you know, it, it doesn't always, it's not always helpful, you know, um, sometimes it's neither here nor there, but uh, we can't really show innocence. We can just show it's not consistent, but we can't say why that is. That's a that's a very good question. Yeah, excellent. All right, next one for you. Uh, we've got lots of folks who are interested in how somebody gets into forensic geology. How what should a student do to get interested in it? Uh, what do you do after you've got like your bachelor's in geology? Okay, so yeah, I would I would recommend. Do a go to a school that has a good geology program. Get get a bachelor's in geology, solid background geology. And then I would recommend um, going on at least for your master's. Um, when I started doing this work, I had a master's. I've since gone back and, and gotten a PhD. Um, but I'd recommend at least going on for your master's and kind of figure out what you're interested in because this is a really exciting time for forensic geology. We're still an emerging field, but there's so much interesting work. Um, that, that people are, are doing and, and different methods that are being applied. So um, some big ones tend to be geochemistry um, and geophysics, uh, geophysics looking for the bodies, geochemistry doing the kind of work I do. But you also have, have other fields that use other analyses that are kind of starting to come forward. So pick an area in, um, so I, I should say right now, there isn't really a way to do forensic geology as a master's. 
now i'm hopeful that that's going to change soon and there are kind of some i guess uh uh ways to potentially get around that one is nc state um has a uh excellent forensic uh science initiative um and i'm not sure if they've started offering the phd yet but i know they at least offer the professional masters um and i, I know nc state is is big on um interdepartment collaboration so you may be able to work out um, where you could do kind of a joint master's between the two programs. Uh, West Virginia University will be another one to look at. They have an excellent geology program and an excellent forensic science program, and you might be able to do a joint uh, sort of sort of master's at this point or PhD. Um, the other thing, if, if that fails or, or is not an option, then go um, choose a, a field that is an aspect of geology <clears throat> that is applicable to forensics and do a, a master's um, and or PhD in that, get a really solid background in that, um, and then start talking to your local homicide detectives and, and your local district attorneys and, and uh, let them know the kind of work you can do for them. I'll also shout out, uh, we've got someone in the chat, Marta, who's with uh, App State's Geology and Earth Science Program, who's saying they've got students who might be interested in this kind of work. That's Excellent. Fun. Just to throw them out there as well. Uh, okay. Next one for you. DJ wants to know, are statistics necessary to show the likelihood of this match not being common to another area? We've talked about geology and chemistry. What about the math? So statistics is something I'd like to bring in more. I'd like to start um, working with uh, forensics statisticians. Um, so one thing that to keep in mind with this is, uh, well, well, first of all, we're not necessarily saying that nowhere else on earth can be like this. It's just places that the suspect was likely to have been. And, and we sample those um, places we know they were, um, places they could have gotten you know, material on, on their shoes or gas pillar or whatever. So we, we do sample those to, to be able to rule those in or out. Um, and also, if you think about it, when we're walking around, we're mostly on pavement or sometimes grass. If you look at your shoes, and I'm not talking about hiking boots, you know, you, you wear to Umstead on the weekend. But if you look at the shoes you wear day to day, there tends to not be as much soil on the bottoms of people's shoes as they think there would be. Because we do spend so much time on, on grass and pavement. So, uh, you know, I do think a forensic st statistician would be a great person to, to bring in. I'd, I'd love to, to collaborate if any happen to be on this call. Um, but, uh, but we do take steps to, um, to make sure that we are able to account for the most likely places where a suspect could have gotten soil um, on whatever we're analyzing and uh, make sure we're able to rule those in or out. And it uh, looks like this will be the last question for you. Do you ever do anything with water analysis or work with hydrologists involved in forensics? For example, explosive traces or that kind of thing. So I actually, I am not a hydrogeologist. I don't really have a background in water chemistry, but there are people out there who do. And that is an aspect of, of forensic geology. Um, there are, uh, you can have um, crimes that are environmental in nature. Uh, you can have evidence that, that deals with water chemistry and, and tracers and that sort of thing. So that's not work that, that I do that really fits with my background. My background is um, I, I studied a lot of rocks <laughs> for uh, my bachelor's, my master's, and my PhD. I studied a lot of rocks. And, um, uh, but um, there are people out there who, who do that work. Um, if, they, if this is interesting to people on the call and they want to kind of learn more, um, Raymond Murray wrote a book called Evidence from the Earth. He was kind of like one of the grandfathers of forensic geology. I call it a scientific beach read because it's a paperback book. It's not a really thick. It's really readable. And it highlights all these different kind of ways forensic geology has been used in cases. And so if, if you're interested and you want to delve deeper in this, but you're not really looking to commit to a textbook or something, um, Evidence from the Earth by Raymond Murray, it's, it's a, a really interesting, well-written forensic geology read. All right. 
Heather, thanks again for being on the show today. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. Awesome presentation. Great questions from the audience too. Everybody, thanks for being here and tuning in to today's program. We will, of course, be back here again next Wednesday at noon with another edition of the program brought to you by the Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality, the same department which hosts the NC Geological Survey and Dr. Hannah's work. Uh, and that will be broadcast right here at the Museum of Natural Sciences YouTube channel. So you can subscribe here, click the bell to get notified when we go live. You can also sign up for that Lunchtime Discovery Series email newsletter. The link to that is available over there in the chat. Give it a click and get signed up. Until next time, everybody. Uh, well, maybe I'll see you soon. I should let everybody know we're doing a really cool, fun event tomorrow night here at the museum called Brain Night. We've got 28 exhibitors who are going to be on the first floor of the older building of the museum tomorrow night and special presentations with neuroscientists. So if you like this sciencey kind of thing, come and hang out with us tomorrow night at six o'clock at the Museum of Natural Sciences. Okay, I did my commercial. Everybody take care, stay safe. We'll see you again real soon. Bye, everybody. <laughs>